Good morning. This is Bill from Curious Cars doing another episode from Peter's driveway on, you know, what's a reasonably nice Florida morning. I certainly can't bitch today. Uh, driving over here, it was in the 60s, kind of the mid-60s. It's already heated up a little bit and, you know, it's going to get a little bit warmer as we go. But uh, we are having a decent spell of weather for once, which means there's about three or four weeks now, potentially, where I don't complain about the weather. Uh, we'll see. Uh, you know, after that passes, I'll complain again, and of course, then the downward trend or upward trend temperature-wise comes. So, uh, But for the moment, I'm going to pause it there, and for, you know, some of the folks in the comments who say, stop complaining about the damn weather. I'm up to my ass in snow here. Uh, well, this one's for you. So that's it. The weather's decent this morning. It's okay, and we're going to move on from there. And what I've got today is a bit of a rare treat. I have to say, it's nothing I was expecting to have and yet here it is. Uh, this is a 1950 Lincoln Cont uh, Continental Cosmopolitan convertible. I get that a little bit confused. In fact when I was searching for 1950 Lincoln Continentals I couldn't find any since there aren't actually any. It was a Cosmopolitan in this year and uh, it's one of only 536 convertibles produced. Uh, they made a fair amount more coupes and sedans although not many in 1950. But only 536 of these things were built. Uh, less than 100, a fair amount less than 100, are known to remain. Uh, so we're talking about a pretty rare car here. It's not something you're going to pass as you're driving around the street. Uh, the chances are pretty slim. Uh, this one is finished in the original color, Chantilly Green, I believe. You know, don't hold me to that. I'm sure I'm going to get corrected a uh, hundred times by Lincoln guys on this video. But, you know, 50s aren't really my my shtick, so I'm going to go with them as best I can. But I do believe this is the original Chantilly Green, and uh, it's over a burgundy leather, uh, which to me is a very striking color combination, and it looks nice. So uh, anyway, there it is. But you go back to 1949, and Lincoln released these cars. They were their first new post-war car bodies. Uh, there was a junior Lincoln, smaller than this, based on the Mercury 8, uh, and then this top flight Cosmopolitan, which had sort of its own exclusive body. I mean, it wasn't terribly different from the Fords and Mercury's, but it was different enough. And uh, a long wheelbase that uh, it had all, you know, all to itself. Uh, and of course, they came in sedans, coupes, convertibles. Uh, there was a town coupe, which had kind of a fastback, but nobody wanted those for some reason. I guess they looked dated to people then, uh, so that quickly faded. Uh, and the styling of this is considered to be kind of a second wave and uh, pontoon styling, which is now an archaic term and uh, not really used. And it roughly refers to cars from the 30s through the 1960s, uh, where the body was sort of contiguous. Uh, in some cases like this one, it was bulbous, slab-sided, and all-encompassing. You know, like the Lincoln that was released before this one was uh, the Edsel version, and it still had running boards between the fenders. Well, you're not going to see that on this. Uh, no running boards anywhere. And uh, the hood, the doors, the trunk, uh, it's all kind of smoothed into the overall body. And uh, it was uh, terribly new at the time. It was sort of to accommodate trendy modern buyers of the 1950s, the post-war prosperous boom times, uh, you know, where people wanted something new. They were kind of sick of the past for obvious reasons and uh, wanted something that they hadn't seen before. And uh, if you know, Frazier and uh, the Kaisers had come out a couple years before with the styling, uh, it got very popular and very trendy, and Lincoln sort of borrowed that for uh, these, uh, these cosmopolitan models. They only lived from 49 to 51, three model years. Uh, after that, the cosmopolitan became the junior model and the Capri became the top of the line. Uh, but you know, that's all Ford minutia stuff. Um, and uh, some would say it's got that upside down bathtub look uh, that's kind of famous to the era, the fat fendered era, a bit like the original Porsche Speedster actually. And laugh as you will at the Speedster comparison. Uh, while this certainly wasn't a sporty car in any stretch of the imagination, uh, the Cosmopolitan was pretty robust and actually made a really strong showing, including class wins, uh, at the early runnings of the grueling 
uh, Carrera Panamericana road race in Mexico, kind of a famous brutal race that was, you know, run and claimed lives and spectators' lives and, you know, cars were destroyed and that sort of thing. And it did well. Uh, it actually reminds me a little bit of Briggs Cunningham running that Cadillac at Le Mans, famously. Uh, so that's a car that's in our local museum, the Collier, you know, that's called Rev's Institute now, but it's the Collier Museum. And uh, he was a friend of Briggs Cunningham, so a lot of his cars are there, and that Cadillac is there so I've kind of touched that one which is kind of fun to see but uh, it weighs about 4,400 pounds it's unmistakably a large luxury car and that's despite Penelope she doesn't have anything to do with this car but she saw it and she commented on it and uh, she made this really incorrect irritating and insulting comparison uh, to the 1947 Ford Super Deluxe convertible uh, driven by Mr. Miyagi and the Karate Kid the nerve of that woman. I mean, no comparison at all. It just absolutely irritates me. Uh, but uh, anyway, in 49, they proved popular. Lincoln sold about 74,000 of them. Uh, but they faded fast. And 1950, production was only about 28,000, a nearly 60% drop. Uh, some of that was because of competition and, you know, other new cars running around. Some of it was because Ford just didn't have a shit together entirely yet, better than they had. They'd seen some tougher times uh, in the prior decade or so. Uh, they were a little bit behind GM in terms of technology. They hadn't been flush with cash until, of course, the World War II bucks came in. And uh, they were just starting to get their footing uh, when this car was released. So I tell you what, let's have a quick look at 1950. Uh, when this car was rolling the streets as kind of a status symbol, you know, shiny and new and running around. Um, so what do you have? The, the big news is the Korean War began. The North invaded the South. Uh, this ultimately led to the TV show MASH winning 14 Emmys and a Peabody Award and uh, uncannily predicted the look of our modern army which uh, I won't get into. Uh, the war ended in 1953 with the South going on to become kind of an industrial powerhouse uh, with a severe pop music issue and uh, the North uh, struggling to keep the lights on while building their Long Dong missiles. So, you know, priorities. Uh, then, what, the, the crime of the century, it was called in 19... The Brinks Armored Car Depot in Boston uh, was burglarized by a group of 11 guys in a well-planned and coordinated robbery, uh, masterminded by a guy named Anthony Pino. Uh, they successfully stole almost three million bucks until one of the robbers, a guy named O'Keefe, uh, he was captured for another crime and threatened to sing like a canary in, you know, 1950s lingo. Uh, and his old friends quickly put out a hit on him, which failed, didn't work at all. And uh, of course, then he was pissed off, so he ratted all of them out. And uh, they all ended up going to jail for the life sentence. And they were like a few months away from being past the statute of limitations. <laughs> so it just didn't work out for those cats at all. Uh, in a very nice May day, uh, Vigo and Emil Hajgard. Hesh uh, I actually had to have a note on that because I can't pronounce Scandinavian names at all. But they found a mummified body uh, of a 4th century guy in a peat bog in Denmark uh, who became known as the Tulland Man. And he was initially dug up as uh, kind of a murder scene. They, you know, the guy was so well preserved, they thought, holy shit. You know, this dude's been murdered, but the police sort of quickly figured out from his clothing and gear and, you know, weird shit that he had, that this wasn't exactly current. They'd found other bodies before that were preserved, so they went to a museum and they confirmed that it was this ancient dude, uh, a guy about 30 years old who had died by hanging uh, while being sacrificed to the gods and buried in a peat bog uh, by his village about 2,400 years ago. So that guy had a really shitty day. Um, in other news, you had President Harry Truman. He sent the United States military uh, mostly advisors and personnel uh, to Vietnam to aid uh, French forces. So, you know, that was a fine mess those pricks got us into. Uh, also, NATO is formed. Uh, South uh, Africa officially embraces apartheid. Um, 
China invades Tibet and uh, Senator McCarthy starts his whole communist hunt, which, you know, he probably did unearth a few, truth be known. But uh, anyway, that all ended badly. Uh, Technology-wise, and this is key, uh, Zenith released the first television remote control. That was a big day for lazy bastards like me. And uh, a guy named William Shockley invented the transistor for Bell Telephone and almost certainly didn't get enough money for it. Uh, also, Diners Club released the first credit card, uh, which was made of cardboard. And I think that's weird. In the 50s, I would have expected it to be made out of lead or, you know, reinforced steel or bakelite or something that could withstand a nuclear blast. But, yeah, apparently it was made out of cardboard. No plastic around. Uh, born in 1950, you had Tom Petty, uh, Jay Leno, Stevie Wonder, Dr. Phil. Uh, movies, you had Sunset Boulevard, you had Annie Get Your Gun. Uh, TV brought the uh, Ed Sullivan Show, The Lone Ranger, and uh, of course Howdy Doody. And uh, on the radio you had Bing Crosby, Nat King Cole, and the Andrew Sisters. I have to look them up and see if they were hot, but I kind of doubt it. Uh, so there was 1950, which was a nice peaceful time in America when people were moving to the suburbs, uh, kids watched Saturday matinee cartoons in the movie theater on the afternoons and violence wasn't happening in the streets as much or on TV at night and milk was still delivered to your door and uh, frankly women were much better behaved and more amenable in those days. Um, you know, they were vacuuming the house in pearls and high heels while cooking a roast with two veg and Oh, God, how the world has changed. Uh, anyway, I'm going to take a quick break there. We're going to get back into this particular car and uh, see what we got. So bear with me a minute. All right, so we better get rolling before the sun comes out and ruins basically everything, the least of which isn't the temperature. And uh, we'll jump right into the styling of this car. I will say very quickly, and I should have mentioned at the beginning, uh, I bought this car about a week ago. And um, again, I, it's outside my wheelhouse. So I decided I'm going to run it through that Mecham auction in Kissimmee. So it's going to be going through on January 15th. On the off chance that you guys, anyone out there has been jonesing, uh, for a 1950 Lincoln Cosmopolitan convertible. Well, that's going to be your chance. It's going to be at that sale. And uh, I have very little intention of bringing it back home with me. So hopefully it does well enough. I got to at least get what I paid for it. We'll see if that happens. Uh, that's doubt. Eh, you never know. I hope so. It's a hell of a nice car. Frame off restoration. I've got all the uh, photos from that. The guy kept a book and a log and, uh, you know, had it to every nut and bolt was off the thing. The frame was powder coated, the engine rebuilt and so on and so forth. So, uh, pretty well, uh, pretty well sorted car and really drives nice. But anyway, we'll get into that. So look at the styling of this thing. Basically it's fat fendered, slab sided. There's a significant use of chrome as we were getting into in the 1950s. Even the hubcaps look fat. Uh, the sedans had suicide doors, uh, which would of course go on to become kind of a famous Lincoln uh, Continental thing, particularly in that Kennedy era car. And uh, well, we all know how that ended. Uh, speaking of presidential cars, it was um, the 1950 Cosmopolitan that was selected by uh, Harry Truman. Yeah, the story goes, and who knows, he was unhappy with GM because they didn't provide him any cars for his campaign. Uh, so when he got into office, he said, screw him, uh, went to Lincoln and ended up with, uh, well, okay, it's kind of an up yours to GM. He turned to Lincoln, he provided him with vehicles. They bought 10 Lincoln Cosmopolitans, uh, nine full-bodied cars and one convertible, uh, and a couple at least with uh, bubble tops. They looked like the, um, uh, you know, the turrets on a B-52 or something. And uh, they became presidential cars. And that sort of set a trend. Lincolns were presidential cars, you know, just about as much as Cadillac was for many, many years. Um, so anyway, kind of kind of interesting shit. But everything on the car is round and soft. I mean, there's no hard edges anywhere. Uh, gone are any creases or lines. Uh, the trunk you can see is sort of molded into the body, as are the fenders, as are the doors. Uh, you know, it's got um, uh, fender covers. They were standard on the car. Giant chrome trim over the front wheel. Fascinating. Uh, one of these big, incredibly ornate 50s style bumpers, particularly with this being um, 
you know, kind of a luxury car at the time. And uh, it's just, it's sort of sweet. You know, the wide whites, the cosmopolitan script, the stainless down at the bottom of the doors. Uh, it's got this curved windshield, which looks terrific. Uh, everything on it is sort of streamlined and modern looking. Certainly it would have been very outside the box in 1950. Um, and it was also part of a famous customization genre. Not so much the Lincolns, more the Fords and the Mercuries. Uh, but I'm sure you've heard the phrase lead sled. Uh, and it's often misused because it, it, lead basically refers to the body filler that they used back then. And a lot of these cars were de-chromed or de-badged, so they had holes in them. So they ended up using lead to fill them. And that's where that came from. Uh, sled because they lowered the car. So it would look like they were kind of slip sliding down the road. And uh, it was sort of a look. It became a big thing. Uh, most commonly, it's 4950 and 51 Ford shoebox cars, as they're called, or Mercury 8s. Uh, and also, to some extent, these Lincolns. Uh, and the alterations they did to those things read like the hash brown menu at Waffle House. Uh, the cars are chopped, channeled, sectioned, French, shaved, uh, debadged, dechromed. One of the more famous examples is that um, sort of heavily cut customized 1950 Mercury Monterey in the Sylvester Stallone movie Cobra. Uh, you know, he famously drove a lead sled in that thing. And, uh, you know, this is essentially one of those cars. Uh, you know, French refers to the headlights, which this has naturally. Um, and you see they're kind of recessed into the body. That was a new thing at the time. You know, they're coming back from when every light looked like this thing on the bumper, the, you know, the fog or driving lights it has there. Uh, now all of a sudden they're sort of sunk into the car. Uh, the hoods are not nearly as distinct. Uh, the fenders compared to earlier cars are almost non-existent. You don't even know they're there. I mean, they're enormous, obviously, uh, but they don't look like the fenders of the cars that came before it. Uh, and the whole side is sort of pushed out. You got these fender skirts. You got a neat little uh, push chrome door handle there. Uh, you got um, a big wraparound chrome bumper in the back. The rear tail lights are also Frenched. They're sunk into the uh, body. You got some bumperettes there. You got a cool little triangular exhaust. Uh, you got the Lincoln badge with the knight uh, ready to slice somebody's head off if you know he's inclined. Like the big hinges on top of the car, they haven't been sort of integrated into the inside yet and you know they look nice and chrome. You got a fuel filler door there. Nice chrome strip on the belt line and a very tall belt line on this car. Um, you know, the look kind of quickly faded and people didn't like it after a few years. Uh, but it also does act and look much like modern cars, you know, with a very tall belt line. One of the differences, the visibility out of this car is actually pretty great. Uh, the curved windshield, very cool. Uh, it's got suicide wipers to sort of match the suicide doors. Um, this one is a pretty upmarket version. It's got twin side view mirrors. Uh, it's got those uh, driving lights in the front. You got more night emblems. You got this, uh, fan, not a fan, to be honest, the bird emblem, or you know, it looks like a jet kind of, but it's a bird. <clears throat> which thank God they've been kind of kept quiet. And uh, all in all, it just is a very modern car for its time. And you can still kind of see the modernity of it today if you look at it. You know, obviously it looks like a tremendous vintage car, uh, but it does have sort of a modern look that led into the space age and, uh, you know, was continued on. So anyway, look, let's have a look inside the trunk, see what we got. In fact, it's a mess in there, but I'll show you why. There's a nice little pincher thing. You can see, man, the, the engineering at this time, you could see no expense was spared on this kind of stuff. I love the holes in the bottom of the trunk to reduce the weight. Uh, it's almost like something Lotus would have designed. I just think that's really cool. Uh, and you can see, and they're all scattered around because I didn't want them falling over. Uh, here's all the trophies that this car has won, including that I feel like I won the Stanley Cup with this one, you know, hold it above my head. Uh, the best primary division, 49 to 57, uh, Eastern Meat in Independence, Ohio. Nice. And uh, here's a second place. Here's another second place. Uh, this thing's missing a wheel. What the hell was that? Man, I don't know if that won anything. 
There's another first place annual Grand National Meet in Kalamazoo. And uh, here's another best of show senior division in Philadelphia. So the car has done quite well. And uh, again, that's because it was so properly restored. Uh, there's a whole fleet of documents with it. I haven't really gotten into these things yet, uh, but it does sort of tell the history of the car and it's nice that that comes with it. Uh, this book here is fantastic. Uh, this is uh, the photos that were taken of the restoration. And uh, you kind of can see that this thing was completely dis assembled uh, down to the frame the body on wheels you know one of these rotisserie type things everything stripped uh, the frame powder coated uh, a lot of the materials powder coated and uh, every nut and bolt basically off the car engine and transmission rebuilt you know this guy spent a ton of money definitely north of a hundred grand making this car look the way that it does today and uh, you can see that the uh, amount of labor that went into it is fantastic. And also, I'm sure it was a long project, because if you look at the cars in the background, uh, I don't really see anything modern. I see Corvettes and, uh, you know, what do we have? There's a Lincoln and one of them a town car. Um, El Caminos, Rangers. Uh, there's a Ford truck, looks like late 90s. So uh, I think that's when this car was finally complete, uh, completed, was in the late 90s. But uh, pretty cool that it has this book with it, uh, which shows the uh, progression of it from, you know, something he found that uh, was obviously a nice, clean, no rust car uh, to something that's, you know, 100% show worthy. So uh, really cool stuff. Have a look under the hood. Kind of interesting that it has a hood release as well. I wasn't expecting that. I figured it would just have the front release, but again, something of a luxury car, so. And this is kind of, oh God. <laughs> Interesting how, first of all, how difficult it would be to work on this thing because the hood barely comes up. The mechanic's going to crack his head. Uh, but everything's sort of as it should be. And this was the first V8 engine ever put into a Lincoln. Uh, but it was not new at the time. In fact, it was repurposed from Ford trucks. And it's a 337 cubic inch flathead. Uh, that means it doesn't have overhead valves. They're, they're kind of built into the block. It's not really a Hemi like you'd expect with the valve or the spark plugs going in the valve covers. It's you know, one of the famous flathead engines. And, uh, you know, Oldsmobile and Cadillac were a little bit more cutting edge at the time with their overhead valve stuff. Uh, but Lincoln took this Ford truck motor and sort of fine-tuned it. They balanced it beyond what the truck motor had. Uh, it's got hydraulic lifters for smoothness and quietness. And the um, the nature of a flathead was kind of quiet anyway, and they made it even quieter. So um, this is a tremendously smooth running, quiet engine and uh, works extremely well in a luxury car. I want to say it has about 160 horsepower. You got like a Holly uh, carb on top factory and uh, there's a big generator. The, you know, everything looking great under there and was a terrific engine. Here's another interesting bit is Ford didn't have an automatic transmission at this time. Uh, they had tried to make one in the early 40s called the Liquimatic, and I think that was apt because the thing turned to liquid as they were trying to use it. So they didn't have an automatic, but they needed one because luxury cars were supposed to have them by 1950. Uh, they tried to buy one from Packard, uh, but it turned out that Packard just couldn't supply them in the numbers needed. They were, you know, just too small. So hilariously, Ford went to GM and bought Hydromatics, which they used for a few years on these cars and uh, to me that's just kind of fascinating it's one of the rare instances of a collaboration between Ford and General Motors to put an automatic transmission in this Lincoln. I think that's just absolutely fascinating. And uh, it works extremely well because you've got the smoothness of the Ford engine, uh, which is inarguable, and then the smoothness of the GM transmission. The Hydromatic is a great, uh, great tranny. 
a great transmission and it, uh, it just all comes together really well. Uh, it's got coil springs in the front, it's got a live axle with leaf springs in the back, four wheel drum brakes without power but they still manage to stop the car okay as long as you plan ahead and uh, no power steering uh, which um, you know I didn't really notice as, as much as I thought I would uh, primarily because it has this 422 inch steering wheel inside that gives you the leverage you need to stir the, the wheels and tires so I tell you what I'm gonna get everything sort of squared away and sorted and um, get my shit in the back of the car then we're gonna go for a spin actually I tell you what I'm gonna do I'm gonna close the hood and earlier oh god that was too hard earlier I had the top up I'm gonna pause here so you guys can see that bit and uh, then uh, we're gonna come back and go for a spin after the little top segment gets inserted so hang with me a minute all right so here it is with the top up and in place uh, you can see it's uh, the fabric tan saddle colored soft top which looks terrific I presume it was probably custom made I don't think there's a lot of these on the shelf uh, has a glass rear window with a nice chrome surround and uh, just looks terrific overall very very impressive and uh, let's see if we can um, well, let's see if we can get it down. Uh, the windows in this thing are hydraulic electric, <laughs> which is just absolutely bizarre. Actually, it's kind of a thing. I remember the Mercedes 600s had a very similar system, and uh, it's basically an electric motor that runs a pump that runs the windows down and the seat as well. So, um, you know, of course, that's long gone and been replaced with just electric operation, but uh, for a variety of reasons. But let's see how this works anyway. So uh, I don't I think the windows might work Yeah, they do they work without the car running which is interesting There's the two backs You can see how smooth it is they just glide these things so all right, so there are the windows down We undo the top here Seems to be kind of a Twist off a thing. Yeah, there it is. And let's see if we can figure out. I think I'll start it up for this to get some juice. There you go. Yeah, slow starter. All right, let's see if we can get this thing down. I don't think you just push it. I'm sure I saw a hydraulic cable somewhere. All right, well, it's not that thing. All right, it's not this thing. Oh, it's a light. Right, I'm ashamed to say I have absolutely no idea where the uh, the top switch is in this thing. Let me see if I can work it manually. Oh, there it is. I managed to push it down myself. I'm going to have to figure out where the switch is. Um, kind of ashamed to say I never checked that out before the video and it became something of a mystery. But uh, you can see the size of this thing. And man, with the top down, it's just, it's like a sea ray or something. Just absolutely incredible. Uh, anyway, let me get my bearings about myself and uh, get back into it. So hold on for just a minute. All right, got my stuff in the back, tag on the back. Let's have a look inside and then go for a spin nice with the top down. All right, there in the back, you can see you've got plenty of room in this overstuffed, rich looking leather that looks like a, almost like a Turkish bordello or something, if not a gentleman shooting club in the north of England. Uh, you can see everything nice. Your Canadians are going to be chipper as hell. You just have a little tranny hump there, transmission hump there that uh, doesn't infringe too much. You got these great looking roll down ashtrays with lighters. I didn't check. Did we have lighters on both sides? I can't imagine. We do. Okay, so we got two lighters and two ashtrays in the back, along with a couple of big old shit handles. So uh, you can certainly tell that people smoked uh, in 1950. So uh, it also has power wind, these sort of power hydraulic windows. I was looking for the top switch earlier. Who the hell puts it in the back seat? 
So after I made a botch of that in the video, there it is, I found it. And I've already got the cover on the top, so I'm not gonna run it now, but it turns out that the back seat is where you operate the top from, which seems kind of strange to me. Uh, in the front, you have this power, again, the sort of hydroelectric, hydraulic electric power seat. Uh, works good, let me see if it's running now. Yeah, and you see how fast it works. It's got power of hydraulics. So you can really crush someone with that. Uh, the door panels, beautifully designed, stainless on the bottom, nice ornate armrests, big giant door poles made for, you know, proper 50s Americans. You got your four window switches there. You got a little cranky thing for your smoky vent window. Uh, all the windows are framed in chrome, which looks lovely. Uh, you know, being the 50s and unsafe, instead of, you know, big padded material, you got this lovely paint uh, door panel tops and uh, painted dash which you know looks great but as uh, I think Jay Leno said when he got in a collision they just hosed the blood off and gave the car to the next guy uh, there you have a nice big again enormous giant Lincoln steering wheel to help you with the lack of power steering uh, with a big uh, trim ring with a horn that doesn't seem to blow and I doubt it will change when the car's on but we'll see uh, inside you've got your cluster here you got your oil pressure gauge which is amazing you got your fuel gauge battery temp so you basically got full gauges in this car race style uh, 110 mile an hour speedo and kind of a cool art deco styling uh, you got your air and vent controls there no AC in the car but um, you know they definitely give you a lot of ventilation with it uh, I love the chrome speaker grills over there this does have the uh, high fidelity upgraded, you know, so well, I guess you could have a radio or not, and this one did have a radio. Uh, there's your starter button, your lights, your blower, um, your ignition, your wiper, and uh, more crap down there. I think this is just a cigarette lighter, which it appears to only have one. I'm not actually sure where the ashtray is. I would have thought this is it. Actually, that's probably the speaker grill. Maybe this is the, yeah, there's the ashtray there. So we got a small for the front seat. That's kind of fascinating. And uh, the glove box over here, which uh, miraculously even the light works. I have a picture and you can see it there. So this guy really got it done. And uh, Cosmopolitan script on the dash. Also love the curvature of the windshield that you can see here with the chrome surround. So it nicely glints in your eyes in the sun. Uh, you got these beautiful little thin sun visors up here with lovely chrome hinges on them. Nice rear view mirror. Again, more, I mean, it, you know, the, the fit and finish of this car is fantastic. You can tell America really had its shit together in 1950. And uh, the ornateness of like the badge and the wheel and uh, it's just all absolutely fantastic. So let's see if it'll start. Had a little bit of a weak battery that's probably not gotten any better with me running it, but we'll give it a try. Uh, we're gonna be are we in neutral. Yeah, we're in neutral. Let's see. No, that didn't work. Let's try that again. Come on, baby. Yeah, there it is. And man, you can barely hear that thing. And I mean, I know muffler technology wasn't extremely advanced in 1950, and yet uh, the engine is just so quiet. They used a lot of insulation in the car for one, and uh, the engine by its very nature is quiet. So uh, it's really cool, very modern feeling in terms of the, um, in terms of the acoustics. So, all right, let's get our brake in. There we go. And uh, let's go for a spin. Kind of interesting the way the uh, transmission, there's no park, you have to put the e-brake on, and it starts in neutral, goes to drive low and reverse. And I'm ashamed to say, I mean, I thought the hydromatics were two speeds, but there's a shift there. So we're already in second, and it's gonna shift again. And I read somewhere that uh, some of these things had four speeds, so. Again, maybe one of the Lincoln guys out there can correct me. I'm definitely getting more than two shifts out of this thing, uh, but I was almost convinced that the 50 Hydromatic was a two-speed. And it is very much the original transmission in this thing. So that even at that slow speed, the wheel isn't that hard to turn. A little bit, because it's so enormous. It does sort of infringe on your view a little bit. <laughs> I really, as a little guy, I got to stand up tall to look over the top of the wheel. I can see where the middle old lady would be actually looking through the wheel uh, to drive the car. 
Uh, the vista is awesome. You can see that big bird hood ornament leading the way, the fat hood coming up with the nice little crease in the center. You know, all the chrome wipers and chrome around you. And it's a very, I mean, for something that is 73 years old, it is incredibly civilized to drive. Um, you know, running at 50 miles an hour, it's smooth, it doesn't overheat, it shifts well, it goes down the road well. Um, you know, one could actually drive this thing as a classic car uh, in a way that just surprised me. There's a shift there, so now we're at least in third. So it's kind of interesting to see what's going on with that. Uh, but anyway, it's just a terrific car to drive, and it gets attention. Uh, people find it kind of fascinating because, again, you just don't see many of these things. They're not all over the roads. Uh, the wheel is fairly smooth and steady. You know, I'm sure these Firestone tires are 15 years old, but they're holding up pretty well with the wide whites. And uh, it's just a lovely car to take down the road. I could imagine pulling up to the you know, the strip club or the Asian massage or uh, the nightclub or the golf course. You know, you'd get a lot of appreciative uh, looks and glances and thumbs up and that sort of thing. There's a shift. And that's it. So look, it's no powerhouse. I mean, you know, we're not talking about 300 horsepower, but it is V8 powered. There's another shift. And uh, it's nice and smooth. It's a lovely car to drive. Didn't bother to try the radio. Anyway, if you have an interest, again, it's running through Mecham, Kissimmee, January 15th. I know the wind noise is absolute shit right now, so I'm not going to continue. And um, I appreciate you guys having a look very, very much. We got more fun stuff coming up, and uh, we will see you with the next one. Take care.